the timeline is strictly, but we restart because we need to maintain the time to keep an agenda in time. So thank you for coming, and remember, we have the possibility to make question at the end of the session. This session is a medical session, and we address about psychological problem. So, uh, with my friend uh, Robbie from Israel, we managed the session. We had invite uh, uh, the professor uh, Antonio Almeida. The, the, the agenda. The session is uh, uh, Lizia Travado. And uh, she talked about uh, patient diagnosis, uh, impact of diagnosis. This session, I repeat, is the psychological impact of diagnosis. It's very important to us to talk. And uh, pay attention, it's a medical session. It's not uh, just uh, to talk about uh, the symptom. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks to the organization, particularly to Giora, who I have known for many years, more than a decade, I think. <laughs> we don't look like it, don't worry. <laughs> and so it's my privilege and pleasure to talk you about to talk to you about the impact of diagnosis. I'm a clinical psychologist uh, with a PhD in psycho-oncology, and I work presently at the Champalimau Clinical Center of the uh, Champalimau Foundation. Do you have a, any pointer? Yes, we have. Oh, it's this one, okay. <clears throat> Does it go? Um, and uh, as a clinician and as a researcher, I was looking because I, because I have a photo to show you. To you, you might... You might see it if you go to Belém. Um, it's a new facility, uh, mostly dedicated to cancer care and also research. And I was also, um, I'm, I'm just became the president emeritus of the International Psycho-Oncology Society, which is the umbrella organization that puts together all the professionals that are interested and in working in the psychosocial oncology area for uh, the benefit of our patients. Is that almost on, Lydia? <laughs> Should I press the button or is it not my fault? Okay, okay. Um, I have been working pr previously in the main central hospital as the clinical, head of clinical psychology, and I have been working mostly with breast cancer and gynecological cancers, but also I, uh, in this center, I have contact with all the patients, all cancer of adult populations, so also leukemia, MPN, etc. Uh, I, because of that, I have also founded, uh, with my colleagues in my previous hospital, an association of patients and professionals and friends and families of our uh, patients so that we could bring together the force and the expertise of the patient into our midst. And this was done in 2003. So I'm very close to your cause and I appreciate a lot what you're doing as patient advocates and as NGOs. And we uh, are fortunate to have you uh, in the teams to put the quest for best cancer policies and implementation of those policies wherever possible in our countries. So thank you very much for having me. This is one of the photos of um, the place that I'm working currently. You can see that it's a beautiful uh, facility and the patients do enjoy it. They, have, they can have chemotherapy in our own Zen garden and this is really a, a treat that uh, they enjoy. So this is mostly what I will speaking to, be speaking to you about um, on my talk. And talking about diagnosis. I found this 
incredible statue in a, a time when I went for a meeting of the gynecological oncology cancers in Nice, France. And it came to me that this was almost a perfect metaphor for diagnosis, right? Um, that the diagnosis, and you, of course, relate to that, is the time of, of our lives in which people are faced with the unknown, um, a black hole, as some of my patients call it. Uh, you don't see what is going into your future and into your present. So I don't know if you agree with me, but I think it, it's an incredible metaphor, and I have been using it since I saw it in uh, Nice, France some years ago. So, talking about the diagnosis, the diagnosis is really a crisis event. It's something that you didn't ask for, but you have to deal with it no matter what. So, uh, in the beginning, you are faced with a number of questions, a number of issues, a lot of emotional reactions, and you have tasks to do. So, this, this uh, table here represents somehow uh, some of the questions that people have at that particular moment, but you can fill pages with the questions that people have. But usually, why me? What, 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 what did cause it? Uh, am I going to die? You know, all these questions that create, of course, in, in a number of emotions and fears. And this is mostly because no one knows when they have the diagnosis exactly what, where they are in the continues of the cancer disease. And the first thing that happens to uh, the mind is the influence the, of the society. I usually say to my patients, well, cancer has a terrible reputation. So you are mostly reacting to that reputation more than your own situation. And so that's something of the work of the psychologist, is really to help people understand what is their case. And a sort of a way put into the garbage all the, the, the bad things that you have heard to, and, have, and try to focus on uh, the news that you have received, the good news about it, what's good, uh, there, and what is the plan? Because if there is a plan and we have a solution, then it seems like it is okay. Um, but that you see here, um, so the emotions are an enormous bit that people have to face. And usually people are not so used, none of us are used to have so many emotions in the same day. It's like a roller coaster, as you have heard. And it's something that we need to deal with um, the patients, the families, the professionals, everyone. So there are a number of coping tasks at this particular phase. So integrate the reality of diagnosis into one's uh, life, tolerate the emotional turmoil, accept increased dependency. It can be the dependency of having someone to drive you to treatment. It doesn't mean that they have to do more uh, small things, but sometimes it's also, also the small things. Um, accept help. It's, women have a lot of difficulty accepting help, usually because they are carers, and they usually do not like that. And uh, it's something that we need to work on um, because it's also a gift to others to, uh, to be able to help the person who is sick. So it's important to work that bit as well. Adjust to the new, new family, the health care professionals, the new house, which is the hospital, or where you are getting treated. Um, Forced all regular daily routines to undergo treatment, make decisions about treatment, communicate illness, diagnosis, and its implications to others. Uh, it's quite difficult to communicate that you have a cancer to elderly parents as well as very young children. So this is one of the topics that I um, take time to discuss with my patients uh, is these two uh, areas of communication. And communication is really important because uh, you cannot carry on with this burden just on your shoulders. You have to share it with people 
But of course, when you share it, then you have add problems. But uh, what kind of life do you want to live? One in which you foster solidarity or isolation? So that's the confrontation that I usually do with my patients. Why? What kind of kids uh, would you like to have them grow into adult adulthood? Selfish kids or kids that value uh, the value of um, solidarity, of helping each other in terms of turmoil. So it's a very good opportunity uh, to uh, disclose into the family and let them help you, have them having tasks. People feel better if they have tasks that they can do to help you. So it's really important, this part of communication, and it's having the family together with you. So uh, what is the problem if you cry a little bit every now and then? Well, everyone needs to, to let it go every now and then. But it's more important to do it together than to do it alone by yourself. And you should not add that burden onto your shoulders. Uh, it's difficult in the beginning, but it may pay out in the end. And that's what I hear from patients who have d done both, sharing and not sharing. Um, also, the survivor goals, best care possible with the least disruption to life. Fortunately, now doctors are paying a little bit more attention to patients' preferences and quality of life. But you need to keep them on, on the spot so that, that they don't forget that you have preferences and they need to hear your preferences and discuss them and so that you can still carry on your life the way you need to have it. Of course, we, you have to do compromises, but it's not an either-or situation. It, you need to ask for compromises from your clinical team. And then you have a number of professional uh, interventions. I will talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, a number of interventions, uh, psycho psychosocial driven, that can help you deal with the hassles and difficulties and concerns that you have throughout uh, the disease and treatment journey and also the survivorship um, to help you get back on track and suffer the least. So I was mostly talking about the impact of cancer, but I would like to show you this slide. So uh, the impact of cancer and its treatments, it's multifolded. It impacts on the physical and functionality, but it's not only that, it's other dimensions. The emotional dimension that we mentioned, the family and interpersonal roles, the social, financial, and occupational strains, existential and spiritual problems facing your own mortality, even though your cancer may be cured, but it nevertheless, you have been faced with a life-threatening disease. So everyone thinks about it, and how am I going, what am I going to do with this new reality that I didn't have, didn't realize before? And of course, the new uh, family, uh, which is the healthcare team. So this creates a pressure, an emotional stress pressure, the diagnosis, that um, was, there was the need to have a different word other than the psychopathology nomenclature that health, mental health specialists use it so that we could understand the type of suffering that patients have which is not uh, pathological, it's just the normal reaction to a crisis event and the turmoil of new emotional reactions that you need to learn how to cope with. And so uh, the, national, um, um, the National Cancer Comprehensive Cancer Network in the US in 1998 has defined, coined this word, distress in cancer, to um, to name the turmoil of the patients when they are facing uh, this new phase in their lives called cancer. So this stress, it's a beautiful definition. It's called, is a multifactorial unpleasant emotional experience of a psychological, social, and spiritual nature 
that may interfere with the ability to cope effectively with cancer, its physical symptoms, and its treatments. And this stress uh, extends a longer continuum, ranging from no common, normal feelings of vulnerability, sadness, and fears, to problems that can become disabling, such as depression, anxiety, panic, social isolation, and this existential and spiritual crisis. So this is, um, um, can be um, graphed like this. So everyone has what is called normal distress, which encompasses these uh, fears, worries, and sadnesses. But the percentage of those um, do not feel able to cope, and those are the ones that require specialized support like a psycho-oncologist specialist or psychologist, psychiatrist, social worker in some, in some uh, uh, countries that social workers also do this, uh, this kind of intervention. So the prevalence of distress has been assessed many years ago with this study, a landmark study of almost 5,000 patients. And uh, we have known uh, since then that thir about 35% of our patients have this form of severe distress. And you can see here, it's not MPN uh, disclosed here, but it's leukemia, it's about 32%. So lung is very high because of uh, the poor prognosis mostly, and gynecological is not that, that, that uh, it's, it's the lowest, but it tends to go around this area. So that gives you like a third of the, one third of the patients do require specialized help. Um, in, our, in our country uh, and in collaboration with Italy and in Spain, we have done an assessment of uh, different cases of cancer and the rates of anxiety, depression were around uh, these figures. I went into the literature, I'm sorry that this is not uh, displayed correctly, to see the prevalence of anxiety and depression in MPN patients. It's a little uh, uh, less, so anxiety on 21%, so cases of real anxiety and depression 12, and having both like this. And it seems that uh, if you have mild system, symptoms, are younger, females, lower education, smokers, or have uh, low levels of physical activity, higher comorbidities, greater financial difficulties, etc., you are more prone to have these uh, severe forms of distress. Um, and in this case, the, the, in this study that was just published in 2000, this year, the conclusion was that there may be an unmet need in handling psychological distress in M MPN patients. I thought that was interesting. Also, this study uh, shows the different symptoms that patients are more prone to do, MPN patients, and 35% is fatigue, and you can relate to the other sleep pains, dryness, tingling, memory concentrations, and so on. And the authors also conclude that the, the burden of physical symptoms are clearly associated with psychological symptoms. So whenever you have patients with too many symptoms, it's likely that they need psychological support. So what are the risk factors for psychological distress? So we have here younger age, being single or divorced, living alone, having children, poor marital functioning, a past history of depression, and also, of course, all the factors of the disease. If the disease is in advanced stage or having a poor prognosis, you are more likely to have um, severe uh, forms of distress. The consequences of psychological morbidity that remains unattended and unaddressed or untreated are, are listed here. And you can see it or not only impacts quality of life, but clinical outcomes by less efficacy on chemotherapy, shorter survival, etc. There are some studies that report that. So patients undergoing uh, cells, uh, stem cell transplantation and who had depression had clearly a shorter survival here, shorter survival than patients who didn't have depression. So now we know 
in, in, by um, the scientific studies that indeed uh, psychological morbidity such as depression uh, does influence negatively your uh, clinical outcomes. Also, this study with breast cancer uh, patients who reacted as, with a helplessness, hopelessness attitude towards diagnosis. Also, 10 years after, we could see that this group uh, had survived much less, and this was uh, statistically significant. So, as uh, the, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network no, not only um, defined distress, but also provided distress management guidelines. And these have been, uh, are reviewed every year. Uh, I brought here the version of last year because uh, Jimmy Holland, our founder of the International Psycho-Oncology Society, has passed away, and this um, was in memoriam of her. So uh, the standards of care for distress management says that sh distress should be recognized and assessed, monitored and documented in all the stages of disease and in all settings. That screening should identify the level and nature of the distress. That all patients should be screened for distress in the initial visit. Distress should be assessed and managed according to the clinical practice guidelines and educational and training programs should be developed to ensure that healthcare professions and certified chaplains have knowledge and skills in the assessment and management of distress and all these other things. But what it says is that, indeed, patients are entitled to have their psychological issues, concerns and problems addressed during uh, the, their treatment it should be part of their treatment plan. And indeed, we have this very easy to fill out uh, screening tool, which is called a distress thermometer. And my patients feel it during their waiting time while they are waiting for the consultation. Um, and also the nurse is a very good instrument for the nurse to use and then um, a triage uh, which patients need psychological support. This has been translated in many, many countries and the cutoffs have been established mostly around uh, uh, four or above. It already requires some attention and probably referral for um, health care professionals, um, mental health care professionals such as a psycho-oncologist. Do I have any more minutes because, because we were late? Uh, with the presentation? No, no, but the, it's late, but the time is... Uh, it's finished, it's okay. Finished. So, uh, to wrap up... Um, Sorry, but... Uh, I am, I, I'm, I, okay, let me just uh, let you know. <laughs> These are many interventions, psychological interventions, that have been proven important. So, just to finalize with this, uh, the International Psycho-Oncology Society, because of all of this evidence that uh, your clinical outcomes may be impacted by psychological morbidity, uh, has put down this standard that psychosocial cancer care should be recognized as a universal human right, and that quality cancer care must integrate the psychosocial domain into routine care as to improve your clinical outcomes, and that distress should be measured as the sick vital sign after temperature after pain, and that this has been um, targeted on the World Cancer Declaration of the Union for International Cancer Control uh, on target eight, which says effective pain control measures and distress management will be available to cancer patients in all countries. So this is something to look for, that all together professionals and patients advocates and organizations need to work on. I have to say that I have had the privilege to be uh, working on recommendations for Europe, for cancer policies to include this, but more than having beautiful documents and wishful lists, we need to go for the implementation now. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor. Uh, please join us uh, at the table. And uh, after uh, the session, at the end of the session, we have the question, if uh, for you it's OK. Please. Okay. Everyone is hearing me or not? I don't know. It's OK. Hello. Yeah. 
No, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay, gentlemen, what I want to know to introduce you, it's Mr. It's Mr. Tagaitabori, that's a social worker, and uh, but he has a very different and totally different background. His background 